Book Two, Chapter Six, of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, A Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book Two, Pendle Forest. Chapter Six, The Temptation. Shortly after Richard's departure, a round, rosy-faced personage, whose rusty black cassock, hastily huddled over a dark riding-dress, proclaimed him a churchman, entered the hostel. This was the rector of Goldshaw, Parson Holden, a very worthy little man, though rather perhaps too fond of the sports, of the field and the bottle. To Roger Nowell and Nicholas Asherton he was, of course, well known, and was much esteemed by the latter, often riding over to hunt and fish or carouse at Downham. Parson Holden had been sent for by Bess to administer spiritual consolation to poor Richard Baldwin, who she thought stood in need of it, and having respectfully saluted the magistrate, of whom he stood somewhat in awe, and shaken hands cordially with Nicholas, who was delighted to see him, he repaired to the inner room, promising to come back speedily. And he kept his word, for in less than five minutes he reappeared with the satisfactory intelligence that the afflicted miller was considerably calmer and had listened to his counsels with much edification. "'Take him a glass of aqua vitae, Bess,' he said to the hostess. "'He is evidently a cut too low, and will be better for it. Strong water is a specific I always recommend under such circumstances, Master Sudrell, and indeed adopt myself, and I am sure you will approve of it. Harky, Bess, when you have ministered to poor Baldwin's wants, I must crave your attention to my own.' and beg you to fill me a tankard with your oldest tale, and toast me an oat-cake to eat with it. I must keep up my spirits, worthy sir,' he added to Roger Nowell, "'for I have a painful duty to perform. I do not know when I have been more shocked than by the death of poor Mary Baldwin, a fair flower and early nipped.' "'Nipped indeed, if all we have heard be correct,' rejoined Nowell. "'The forest is in a sad state, reverend sir.' It would seem as if the enemy of mankind, by means of its abominable agents, were permitted to exercise uncontrolled dominion over it. I must needs say the forlorn condition of the people reflects little credit on those who have them in charge. The powers of darkness could never have prevailed to such an extent if duly resisted. I lament to hear you say so, good Master Noel, replied the rector. I have done my best, I assure you, to keep my small and widely scattered flock together, and to save them from the ravening wolves and cunning foxes that infest the country. But if now and then some sheep have gone astray, or a poor lamb, as in the instance of Mary Baldwin, hath fallen a victim, I am scarcely to blame for the mischance. Rather let me say, sir, that you, as an active and zealous magistrate, should take the matter in hand and by severe dealing with the offenders arrest the progress of the evil. No defence, spiritual or otherwise, as yet set up against them, has proved effectual. "'Just the remark, reverend sir,' observed Potts, looking up from the memorandum book in which he was writing, "'and I am sure your advice will not be lost upon Master Richard Nowell. As regards the persons who may be afflicted by witchcraft, Hath not our sagacious monarch observed, there are three kind of folks who may be tempted or troubled, the wicked for their horrible sins, to punish them in like measure, the godly that are sleeping in any great sins or infirmities, and weakness in faith, to weaken them up the faster by such an uncouth form, and even some of the best that their patience may be tried before the world, as Job's was tried. For why may not God use any kind of extraordinary punishment when it pleases him, as well as the ordinary rods of sickness and other adversities? Very true, sir, replied Holden, and we are undergoing this severe trial now. Fortunate are they who profit by it. Hear what is said further, sir, by the king, pursued Potts. No man declares that wise prince ought to presume so far as to promise any impunity to himself. But further on he gives us courage, for he adds, and yet we ought not to be afraid for that, of anything that the devil and his wicked instruments can do against us, for we daily fight against him in a hundred other ways, and therefore as a valiant captain affrays no more being at the combat, nor stays from his purpose for the ramishing short of a cannon, 
nor the small clack of a pistolet, not being certain what might light upon him, even so ought we boldly to go forward in fighting against the devil, without any greater terror for these his rarest weapons than the ordinary, whereof we have daily the proof. His Majesty is quite right, observed Holden, and I am glad to hear his convincing words so judiciously cited. I myself have no fear of these wicked instruments of Satan. In what manner, may I ask, have you proved your courage, sir? inquired Roger Nowell. Have you preached against them and denounced their wickedness, menacing them with the thunders of the church? I cannot say I have, replied Holden, rather abashed. Uh, but I shall henceforth adopt a very different course. Ah, here comes the ale, he added, taking the foaming tankard from Bess. This is the best cordial wherewith to sustain one's courage in these trying times. Oh, some remedy must be found for this intolerable grievance, observed Roger Nowell, after a few moments' reflection. Till this morning I was not aware of the extent of the evil. But suppose that the two malignant hags who seem to reign supreme here confine their operations to blighting corn, maiming cattle, turning milk sour, and even these reports I fancied were greatly exaggerated, and now I find from what I have seen at Zamden and elsewhere that they fall very far short of the reality. It would be difficult to increase the darkness of the picture, said the surgeon, but what remedy will you apply? "'The cautery, sir,' replied Potts. "'The actual cautery. "'We will burn out this plague-spot. "'The two old hags and their noxious brood "'shall be brought to the stake. "'That will effect a radical cure.' Uh, "'May when it's accomplished, "'but I fear it will be long ere that happens,' "'replied the surgeon, shaking his head doubtfully. "'Are you acquainted with Mother Demdark's history, sir?' "'He added to Potts. "'In part,' replied the attorney, "'But I shall be glad to hear anything you may have to bring forward on the subject.' "'The peculiarity in her case,' observed Soodle, "'and the circumstance distinguishing her dark and dread career from that of all other witches "'is that it has been shaped out by destiny. "'When an infant, a malediction was pronounced upon her head by the unfortunate Abbot Paslew. She is also the offspring of a man reported to have bartered his soul to the enemy of mankind, while her mother was a witch. Both parents perished lamentably about the time of Paslew's execution at Whaley. It is a pity their miserable infant did not perish with them, observed Holden. How much crime and misery would have been spared? It was otherwise ordained, replied Suddle. Bereft of her parents in this way, the infant was taken charge of and reared by Dame Croft, the miller's wife of Whaley. But even in those early days she exhibited such a malicious and vindictive disposition, and became so unmanageable, that the good dame was glad to get rid of her, and sent her into the forest, where she found a home at Rough Lay, then occupied by Miles Nutter, the grandfather of the late Richard Nutter. Aha! exclaimed Potts. Was Mother Demdike so early connected with that family? I must make a note of that circumstance. She remained at Ruffley for some years, returned Sudlow, and though acquainted of an ill disposition, there was nothing to be alleged against her at the time, though afterwards it was said that some mishaps that befell the neighbours were owed to her agency and that she was always attended by a familiar in the form of a rat or mole. Whether this were so or not I cannot say, but it is certain that she helped Miles Nutter to get rid of his wife, and procured him a second spouse, in return for which services he bestowed upon her an old ruined tower on his domains. "'You mean Malkin Tower?' said Nicholas. "'Ah, Malkin Tower,' replied the surgeon. There is a legend connected with that structure, which I will relate to you anon, if you desire it. But to proceed, scarcely had Bess Demdark taken up her abode in this lone tower, than it began to be rumoured that she was a witch, and attended Sabbaths on the summit of Pendle Hill and on Rimington Moor. Who would consort with her, and ill-looking invariably attended those with whom she quarrelled. 
though hideous and forbidding aspect, and with one eye lower set than the other, she had subtlety enough to induce a young man named Southerness to marry her, and two children, a son and daughter, were the fruit of the union. "'The daughter I have seen at Whaley,' observed Potts, "'but I have never encountered the son.' Well, "'Christopher Demdark still lives, I believe,' replied the surgeon, "'though what has become of him I know not, for he has quitted these parts. He is as ill-reputed as his mother, and has the same strange and fearful look about the eyes. I shall recognise him if I see him.' observed Potts. Oh, "'You're scarcely likely to meet him,' returned Sudel, "'for, as I have said, he has left the forest. But to return to my story, the married state was little suitable to Bess Demdike, and in five years she contrived to free herself from her husband's restraint, and ruled alone in the tower. Her malignant influence now began to be felt throughout the whole district, and by dint of menaces and positive acts of mischief, she extorted all she required. Whosoever refused her request speedily experienced her resentment. When she was in the fullness of her power, a rival sprang up in the person of Anne Whittle, since known by the name of Chattox, which she obtained in marriage, and this woman disputed Bess Demdike's supremacy. Each strove to injure the adherents of her rival, and terrible was the mischief they wrought, in the end, however, Mother Demdike got the upper hand. Years have flown over the old hag's head, and her guilty career has been hitherto attended with impunity. Plans have been formed to bring her to justice, but they have ever failed, and so in the case of old Chattox. Her career has been as baneful and as successful as that of Mother Demdike. But their course is well nigh run said Potts, and the time is come for the extirpation of the old serpents. Ah, ah, who is that at the window? cried Suddle. But that you are sitting near me, I should declare you were looking in at us. It must be Master Potts's brother, the reeve of the forest, observed Nicholas, with a laugh. Heed him not, cried the attorney angrily, but let us have the promised legend of Malkin Tower. Willingly, replied the surgeon. But before I begin, I must recruit myself with a can of ale. The flagon being set before him, Sudo commenced his story. The Legend of Malkin Tower On the brow of a high hill, forming part of the range of Pendle, and commanding an extensive view over the forest and the wild and mountainous region around it, stands a stern, solitary tower. Old as the Anglo-Saxons, and built as a stronghold by Wolston, a Northumbrian thane, in the time of Edmund or Edred, it is circular in form, and very lofty, and serves as a landmark to the country round. Placed high up in the building, the door was formerly reached by a steep flight of stone steps, but these were removed some fifty or sixty years ago by Mother Demdike, and a ladder capable of being raised or let down at pleasure, substituted for them, affording the only apparent means of entrance. The tower is otherwise inaccessible, the walls being of immense thickness, with no windows lower than five and twenty feet from the ground, though it is thought there must be a secret outlet, for the old witch, when she wants to come forth, does not wait for the ladder to be let down, but that may be otherwise explained. Internally there are three floors, the lowest being placed on a level with the door, and this is the apartment chiefly occupied by the hag. In the centre of this room is a trap-door, opening upon a deep vault which forms the basement story of the structure, and which was once used as a dungeon, but is now tenanted, it is said, by a fiend, who can be summoned by the witch on stamping her foot. Round the room runs a gallery, contrived in the thickness of the wall, while the upper chambers are gained by a secret staircase, and closed by movable stones, the machinery of which is only known to the inmate of the tower. All the rooms are lighted by narrow loopholes. Thus you will see that the fortress is still capable of sustaining a siege, and old Demdark has been heard to declare that she would hold it for a month against a hundred men. Hitherto it has proved impregnable. 
on the Norman invasion, Malkin Tower was held by Ulchtred, the descendant of Woolston, who kept possession of Pendle Forest and the hills around it, and successfully resisted the aggressions of the conquerors. His enemies affirmed he was assisted by a demon, whom he had propitiated by some fearful sacrifice made in the tower, and the notion seemed borne out by the success uniformly attending his conflicts. Ugtred's prowess was stained by cruelty and rapine, merciless in the treatment of his captives, putting them to death by horrible tortures, or immuring them in the dark and noisome dungeon of his tower, he would hold his revels over their heads and deride their groans. Heaps of treasure obtained by pillage were secured by him in this tower. From his frequent acts of treachery and the many foul murders he perpetrated, Ugtred was styled the scourge of the Normans. For a long period he enjoyed complete immunity from punishment, but after the siege of York and the defeat of the insurgents, his destruction was vowed by Ilbert de Lacy, lord of Blackburnshire, and this fierce chieftain set fire to part of the forest in which the Saxon thane and his followers were concealed, drove them to Malkin Tower, took it after an obstinate and prolonged defence, and considerable loss to himself, and put them all to the sword, except the leader, whom he hanged from the top of his own fortress. In the dungeon were found many carcasses, and the greater part of Ulfred's treasure served to enrich the victor. Once again, in the reign of Henry the Sixth, Malkin Tower became a robber's stronghold, and gave protection to a free booter named Blackburn, who, with a band of daring and desperate marauders, took advantage of the troubled state of the country, ravaged it far and wide, and committed unheard of atrocities, even levying contributions on the abbeys of Whaley and Sally, and the heads of these religious establishments were glad to make terms with him to save their herds and stores. The rather the toll attempts to dislodge him from his mountain fastness and destroy his band had failed. Blackburn seemed to enjoy the same kind of protection as Ulfred, and practised the same atrocities, torturing and imprisoning his captives unless they were heavily ransomed. He also led a life of the wildest license, and when not engaged in some predatory exploit, spent his time in carousing with his followers. Upon one occasion it chanced that he made a visit in disguise to Whaley Abbey, and passing the little hermitage near the church beheld the votaress who tenanted it. This was Isolde Eaton, ravished by her wondrous beauty. Blackburn soon found an opportunity of making his passion known to her, and his handsome, though fierce, lineaments pleasing her, he did not long sigh in vain. He frequently visited her in the garb of a Cistercian monk, and being taken for one of the brethren, his conduct brought great scandal upon the abbey. The abandoned votaress bore him a daughter, and the infant was conveyed away by the lover and placed under the care of a peasant's wife at Barrowford. From that child sprung Bess Blackburn, the mother of old Demdike, so that the witch is a direct descendant of Isolde Eaton. Notwithstanding all precautions, Isolde's dark offence became known, and she would have paid the penalty of it at the stake if she had not fled. In scaling Whaley Nab, in the woody heights of which she was to remain concealed till her lover could come to her, she fell from a rock, shattering her limbs and disfiguring her features. Some say she was lame for life, and became as hideous as she had heretofore been lovely, but this is erroneous, for apprehensive of such a result, tended by the loss of her lover, she invoked the powers of darkness, and, and preferred her soul in return for five years of unimpaired beauty. A compact was made, and when Blackburn came he found her more beautiful than ever. Enraptured, he conveyed her to Malkin Tower, and lived with her there in security, laughing to scorn the menaces of Abbot Eccles, by whom he was excommunicated. Time went on, and as his soul's charms underwent no change, her lover's ardour continued unabated. 
five years passed in guilty pleasures, and the last day of the allotted term arrived. No change was manifest in his old demeanour, neither remorse nor fear were exhibited by her. Never had she appeared more lovely nor had more exuberant spirits. She besought her lover, who was still madly intoxicated by her infernal charms, to give a banquet that night to ten of his trustiest followers. He willingly assented and bade them to the feast. They ate and drank merrily, and the gayest of the company was a lovely soul. Her spirits seemed somewhat too wild even to Blackburn, but he did not check her, though surprised at the excessive liveliness and freedom of her sallies. Her eyes flashed like fire, and there was not a man present but was madly in love with her, and ready to dispute for her smiles with his captain. The wine flowed freely, and song and jest went on till midnight. When the hour struck, it all filled a cup to the brim, and called upon them to pleasure. And all arose, and drained their goblets enthusiastically. "'It was a farewell cup,' she said. "'I am going away with one of you.' "'How?' exclaimed Blackburn, in angry surprise. "'Let any one but touch your hand, and I will strike him dead at my feet.' The rest of the company regarded each other with surprise, and it was then discovered that a stranger was among them, a tall, dark man whose looks were so terrible and demoniacal that no one dared lay hands upon him. "'I am come,' he said, with fearful significance, to his soul. "'And I am ready,' she answered boldly. "'I will go with you were it to the bottomless pit,' cried Blackburn, catching hold of her. "'It is thither I am going,' she answered, with a scream of laughter. "'I shall be glad of a companion.' When the paroxysm of laughter was over, she fell down on the floor. Her lover would have raised her when what was his horror to find that he held in his arms an old woman with frightfully disfigured features and evidently in the agonies of death she fixed one look upon him and expired terrified by the occurrence the guests hurried away and when they returned next day they found blackburn stretched on the floor and quite dead they cast his body together with that of the wretched Isol into the vault beneath the room where they were lying, and then taking possession of his treasure, removed to some other retreat. Thenceforth, Bolkin Tower became haunted. Though wholly deserted, lights were constantly seen shining from it at night, and sounds of wild revelry, succeeded by shrieks and groans, issued from it. The figure of its all was often seen to come forth and flit across the west in the direction of Whaley Abbey. On stormy nights a huge black cat with flaming eyes was frequently descried on the summit of the structure, whence it obtained the name of Grimalkin, or Malkin Tower. The ill-omened pile ultimately came into the possession of the Nutter family but it was never tenanted until the time, as I have already mentioned, to Mother Demdike. The surgeon's marvellous story was listened to with great attention by his auditors. Most of them were familiar with different versions of it, but to Master Potts it was altogether new, and he made rapid notes of it, questioning the narrator as to one or two points which appeared to him to require explanation. Nicholas, as may be supposed, was particularly interested in that part of the legend which referred to Isolde Heaton. He now, for the first time, heard of her unhallowed intercourse with the freebooter Blackburn, of her compact on Whaley Nab with the Fiend, of her mysterious connection with Malkin Tower, and of her being the ancestress of Mother Demdike. The consideration of all these points, coupled with a vivid recollection of his own strange adventure with the impious votaress at the Abbey on the previous night, plunged him into a deep train of thought, and he began seriously to consider whether he might not have committed some heinous sin, and indeed jeopardised his soul's welfare by dancing with her. "'What if I should share the same fate as the robber Blackburn?' he ruminated, "'and be dragged to perdition by her. It's a very awful reflection.' 
but though my fate might operate as a warning to others, I am by no means anxious to be held up as a moral scarecrow. Rather let me take warning myself, amend my life, abandon intemperance which leads to all manner of wickedness, and suffer myself no more to be ensnared by the wiles and delusions of the tempter in the form of a fair woman. No, no, I will alter and amend my life. I regret to say, however, that these praiseworthy resolutions were but transient, and that the squire, quite forgetting that the work of reform, if intended to be really accomplished, ought to commence at once, and by no means be postponed till the morrow, yielded to the seductions of a fresh bottle of sack, which was presented to him at the moment by Bess, and in taking it could not help squeezing the hand of the bouncing hostess, and gazing at her more tenderly than became a married man. Oh, Nicholas, Nicholas, the work of reform, I'm afraid, proceeds very slowly and imperfectly with you. Your friend Parson Dewhurst would have told you that it is much easier to form good resolutions than to keep them. Leaving the squire, however, to his cogitations and his sack, the attorney to his memorandum-book, in which he was still engaged in writing, and the others to their talk, we shall proceed to the chamber where the poor miller had been led by Bess. When visited by the rector, he had been apparently soothed by the worthy man's consolatory advice, but when left alone he speedily relapsed into his former dark and gloomy state of mind. He did not notice Bess, who, according to Holden's directions, placed the aqua vitae bottle before him, but as long as she stayed remained with his face buried in his hands. As soon as she was gone he arose and began to pace the room to and fro, the window was open, and he could hear the funeral bell tolling mournfully at intervals. Each recurrence of the dismal sound added sharpness and intensity to his grief. His sufferings became almost intolerable, and drove him to the very verge of despair and madness. If a weapon had been at hand, he might have seized it and put a sudden period to his existence. His breast was a chaos of fierce and troubled thoughts, in which one black and terrible idea— arose and overpowered all the rest. It was the desire of vengeance, deep and complete, upon her whom he looked upon as the murderess of his child. He cared not how it were accomplished, so it were done, but such was the opinion he entertained of the old hag's power, that he doubted his ability to the task. Still, as the bell tolled on, the furies at his heart lashed and goaded him on, and yelled in his ear, Revenge! Revenge! Now, indeed, he was crazed with grief and rage. He tore off handfuls of hair, plunged his nails deeply into his breast, and committed these and other wild excesses. With frantic imprecations he called down heaven's judgment on his own head. He was in that lost and helpless state when the enemy of mankind has power over man. Nor was the opportunity neglected. For when the wretched Baldwin, who, exhausted by the violence of his emotions, had leaned for a moment against the wall, he perceived, to his surprise, that there was a man in the room, a small personage, attired in rusty black, whom he thought had been one of the party in the adjoining chamber. There was an expression of mockery about this person's countenance which did not please the miller, and he asked him sternly what he wanted. "'Lave off grinning, mon or I may be tempted to take your bite throttle and make you laugh on the wrong side of your mouth. No, you will not, Richard Baldwin, when you know my errand, replied the man. You are thirsting for vengeance upon Mother Demdike. You shall have it. Ah, yeah, you promised me vengeance afore, cried the miller. Vengeance by the law, but I mun wait long for it. I would have it swift and sure, deep and deadly. I would blast her with curses as her blasted my poor Mary. I would strike her dead at my feet. That's my vengeance, mon. You shall have it, replied the other. You don't differently for what you did just now, mon, said the miller, regarding him narrowly and distrustfully. And you look differently, too. There's a queer glimmer about your eye that I didn't notice before, and that I mislike. The man laughed bitterly. Leave off grinning or be gone said Baldwin furiously, and he raised his hand to strike the man. But he instantly dropped it, appalled by a look which the other threw at him. "'Who the devil are you?' "'The devil must answer you, since you appeal to him,' replied the other, with the same mocking smile. "'But you are mistaken in supposing that you have spoken to me before. 
he with whom you conversed in the other room resembles me in more respects than one but he does not possess power equal to mine the law will not aid you against mother demdike she will escape all the snares laid for her but she will not escape me who are you cried the miller his head erecting on his head and cold damps breaking out upon his brow you're no mortal and no good to talk in this fashion heed not who and what i am replied the other i am known here as a reeve of the forest that is enough would you have vengeance on the murderess of your child yea replied baldwin and you are willing to pay for it at the price of your soul demanded the other advancing towards him baldwin reeled he saw at once the fearful peril in which he was placed and averted his gaze from the scorching glance of the reeve at this moment the door was tried without and the voice of bess was heard saying who you got we are richard and why are you fastened the door your answer demanded the reeve i canna give it now replied the miller come in bess come in i canna she replied open the door man your answer i say said the reeve give me an hour to think on agreed replied the other i will be with you after the funeral and he sprang through the window and disappeared before baldwin could open the door and admit bess End of chapter six